Hello, and welcome again to another lovely session of Civil Engineering with Tanya J. Laird. I am the aforementioned Tanya J. Laird. This video will be a bit outside the realm of my typical engineering content, and it is meant as an exploration and introduction to material that will come in later episodes. It's meant to give those with an engineering interest and background a different perspective on the principles and methods of structural design and mechanics. It will explore a different way of looking at structures and will interrogate in detail some of our uh, most common fundamental structural engineering assumptions. In the field of structural engineering, balance of forces is a fundamental foundational concept. On this channel, I have lecture series going into great length exploring topics of statics, mechanics, and structural design. And in many of these courses, the balance of forces is a fundamental uh, principle. We perform global analyses on structures to calculate the forces of wind, rain, live load, and dead load. We apply force balance methods in turn to determine how these forces transfer through a structure and the resulting forces produced in each member of a structure. Geotechnical engineers then in turn design foundations based upon force balance in the soils. The principles of force balance and equilibrium can be found in every facet of structural engineering and design. But what if we step outside what is typically considered in structural design? Let us look beyond a building's frame, beyond its foundation, beyond even the area of soil directly supporting the structure. Here we consider the earth itself. As engineers, how do we model the earth itself? While civil and structural engineers construct the largest items built by humanity, we model the earth beneath our feet in a particular way. The interaction of our structures with the ground is typically limited to treating it as a static supporting element. We may model it as a fixed or spring support, but we generally treat it as an unmoving infinite mass. In limited cases, we do acknowledge that motion is inherent in the earth. We do use ground motion when designing structures for seismic load, but even then we still treat the earth as an infinitely large block, one that just happens to be moving. The ground beneath our buildings is treated as an infinite mass, dragging their bases along with it. While this modeling is adequate for designing conventional structures, I want to here explore the Earth in a different physical framework. I want to explore the role of a different physical mechanism, not simply the principles of force, but momentum, and how principles of momentum conservation ultimately produce the illusion of the solid ground beneath our feet. Now, let us once again return to the beginning. Consider perhaps the most elementary principles of structural engineering, Newton's laws. Consider Newton's first law, an object in motion stays in motion unless acted upon by an outside force. From this comes the conservation of momentum. Newton's second law, force equals mass times acceleration. Any net force on an object produces an acceleration in that object. Combining the two produces the impulse momentum theorem, F delta T is equal to M delta V in scalar form, or in integral form, the integral of F dt is equal to delta P. While this of course is elementary physics, I find it useful to come back to this fundamental uh, relationship between force and momentum. Any net force will produce a change in momentum, and any change in momentum demands a force in return. We model wind as a force acting on a building, but that force arises from a change in momentum. Wind only produces a force on a building or structure because air molecules striking the building's surface must change speed or direction. Wind is directed around a building. The change in momentum is thus coupled with a force upon the building. The building in turn imparts a force into the ground, which in turn produces an imperceptibly small change in the momentum of the planet below. Force and momentum are never far from each other if sometimes the relationship is hidden. Still, in structural engineering, we tend to view momentum as an undesirable thing. If our buildings and structures are moving, we want them to stop moving as soon as possible. An earthquake produces motion and thus seismic forces in a building, but this is an undesirable state. We design our structures to survive these motions and forces and to return the structure to a state of rest as soon as possible. Momentum is something exterior we apply to a structure. It is always a negative thing. Static strength is good, desirable, and internal to a structure, while motion is exterior and undesirable. This is the conventional way of framing momentum in a structural engineering context. We design our structures to resist changes in momentum. 
we don't use changes in momentum to support the structures themselves. Momentum supported structures can be found, but we need look past what we usually consider within the definition of a structure. Consider, for example, an airplane in flight. An airplane is a structure held aloft by exchange of momentum. As a wing moves through the air, it forces air downward. When air is forced downward, momentum must be conserved and the plane experiences an upward force, which we refer to as lift. A plane is simply a structure. It may be moving through the air at great velocity, but the same principles of structural engineering and mechanics are used in the design of airframes as in terrestrial buildings. But certainly our familiar buildings are entirely supported purely by static forces, are they not? How could a building sitting stationary on the Earth's surface somehow be supported by conservation of momentum? Let's zoom out beyond our ordinary scale of consideration and take a look. The first case where momentum conservation can be considered as providing structural support can be seen in orbital mechanics. Orbits can be looked at in a number of ways. From a kinematics point of view, the Earth can be said to orbit the Sun due to its velocity. The Sun accelerates the Earth towards it, but it has enough forward velocity that the actual distance to the Sun remains constant. The Sun's surface falls away as fast as we fall towards it, and thus we remain safely in orbit above our star. It can also be considered, however, from a dynamics point of view. Consider again the Sun. Hold an object in your hand, maybe a phone. Hold it out and feel the force from the phone's weight on your hand. Stand up, feel the force of your weight on your feet. This is the force of gravity the Earth pulls on the phone and on yourself. Now, zoom out and consider the immensity of the Earth and the Sun. The Earth, so massive that we model it as having infinite mass when designing buildings. The Sun, over 300,000 times as massive still. Imagine, try to grasp for a, for a fleeting moment, the titanic attractive forces that exist between these two bodies, though the distance between them is large. The Sun's great mass is pulling on the Earth with this immense force, approximately 8.2 times 10 to the 21 pounds, if you're curious, every moment of every day. The sun's great bulk pulls on the earth with force of immensity beyond measure, trying to pull the earth deep into its thermonuclear fire. What resists this titanic force? Well, the earth's momentum. Gravity, like all forces, is a vector. Because of the Earth's immense momentum vector, the great gravitational force of the Sun is not able to draw the Earth into it. The direction of the Earth's momentum vector continuously changes, but its magnitude remains constant. Thus, the Earth's momentum balances the Sun's gravitational force, and our world is saved from the fire. This can be extended up another level to the star system as a whole. As the Earth orbits the Sun, the Sun in turn orbits the galaxy. On an unimaginably long circuit of over 200 million years, the solar system slowly circles the galactic core. Uh, slowly here meaning a mere 450,000 uh, miles per hour. Thus the solar system's momentum keeps it from falling into the radiation blasted galactic core and deeper still to the monster dwelling within. Without our solar system's momentum about the galactic core, our star and we might eventually find our way to the 3 million solar mass black hole at the galaxy's center. Momentum holds the Earth from the fire of the sun, and in turn, momentum holds the sun against an even greater terror. Such is the importance of momentum in orbital mechanics. Consider next the Earth itself. The ground in which we live is but a thin layer of solid crust atop the much greater bulk of the Earth's interior. What seems solid and immovable is in fact a thin layer of frozen rock floating atop a sea of molten magma more than a thousand miles deep. What holds up above this burning, roiling, boiling sea of fire? Well, buoyancy keeps us aloft. But what is buoyancy? Buoyancy is a force produced by fluids, but it does not originate from some material strength of these fluids. A column of wood or steel will be able to resist immense vertical load, 
but an unconstrained column of water will instantly collapse under its own weight, let alone be able to support any kind of load. Fluids do not resist any force that wishes to change their shape, thus buoyancy can arise from any kind of material strength. Rather, fluid mechanics teaches us that the buoyant force uh, can be derived from differences of pressure with depth. A column of fluid in a gravitational field produces pressure, and the difference of pressure across the volume of an object creates the net force that we call the buoyant force, uh, or the buoyant force that an object experiences in a fluid. The crust has an average density lower than the material of the mantle, and thus it and we are able to float atop it. Let us look closer and examine pressure. What is pressure? Well, a simple definition of pressure is a force over an area, but from where does that force arise, especially in fluids? Zooming into the molecular level, pressure is found to be the result in collision between molecules against each other or against the surface. Molecules in a fluid are continuously colliding against each other and against any solid surface within them. A solid object experiences a buoyant force in a fluid because the molecules in that fluid are constantly colliding with its surface. When a molecule collides with the surface and reverses direction, it changes momentum. This requires a force to be applied to the molecule, and in turn a force applied to the surface. Pressure thus is nothing more than the interplay of force and momentum between a solid and a fluid. And thus we can see what ultimately levitates our planet's crust and everything on it from plummeting deep into the fires below. The force produced when the molecules of the mantle strike the planet's crust results in a buoyant force which holds the crust aloft. Without this molecular level exchange of momentum, no buoyant force could exist, and thus what we perceive as solid ground might actually be anything but. As a final example, consider the overall shape of the Earth itself. We typically conceive of the Earth as a sphere, but that is not in fact the case. The Earth's true shape is an oblate spheroid. The diameter uh, across the equator is larger than the diameter at the poles by approximately 26 miles. The reason for this is due to the Earth's rotation. As the Earth turns, every piece of its surface experiences both an inward and an outward force. The outward force is the centrifugal force of the Earth's rotation. The inward force is the Earth's gravity. The shape of the Earth's surface, barring topographic features like mountains and valleys, traces a path that maintains a constant potential across the surface. If the Earth were not rotating, the Earth's shape would be spherical, but it is stretched out due to the Earth's spin. From a structural perspective, what I find so fascinating about this is that the very ground beneath us is in fact a kind of structure directly supported by rotational momentum. The Earth's current shape is completely unstable except for the fact that it is rotating. If the planet's rotation were to somehow magically stop, the planet would seek to relax to a perfectly spherical shape. That slight 26 mile difference may be a small on a planetary scale, but it is immense on a human scale. The process of shifting to such a new shape would be tremendously violent, a seismic and volcanic event of unimaginable, incomprehensible scale. This would likely melt the entire crust and completely wipe out all life on the planet, all the way down to the bacterial level. Thus, the Earth's rotational momentum keeps us uh, safe from yet another cataclysm. Thankfully, we live in a universe where conservation of momentum does apply, and the Earth's momentum cannot instantly magically disappear. Still, I find it interesting and humbling to note that we live on a surface that is only stable as long as it remains in continuous, never-ending motion. The point of this video is of course not to cause alarm. Out of all the many things to worry about in life, especially in, the, in a time such as this, the stability of the Earth's surface or orbit is not one of them. While the Earth's surface is maintained through an intricate dance of conserved momentum, it is a naturally occurring, extremely resilient system. The point of this video is simply to shine a light on the influence momentum and motion 
have on the stability of the Earth itself, and in turn all the buildings and structures we construct upon it. We are accustomed as engineers to treating the Earth as solid and unmoving, but its very stability is entirely dependent on motion and momentum conservation. This video will serve as a seed for future thoughts I wish to explore on this channel, but hopefully for now you simply find it intriguing and that this provided a different perspective from one you are accustomed to considering. Regardless, I hope you found this interesting and I hope it gives you something to think about, whatever kind of structures or civil engineering design you may be involved in. Uh, of course, as I'm supposed to say, like and subscribe if you do, and feel free to leave a comment below if you have any thoughts of your own. Regardless, I hope to see you all again soon, and as always, thank you.